Hey, my second front aficionados. This is Neil. I'm back with another video, this time to show you how to effectively use uh, AFVs in second front and to uh, kind of give you some under the hood looks at what's going on with combat and movement and that sort of thing. This is going to be a multi-part video series, two or three videos covering uh, the mechanics of covered arcs, movement, machine gun use, close combat, um, haul down maneuvering, uh, limit, using them to eliminate units for failure to route. Uh, I'm forgetting some things, but uh, it's going to be a multi-part series. Make sure you use the timestamps down below. I don't think timestamps show up on mobile, but on desktop and probably tablets and whatnot. Use the timestamps to jump around to the topics of interest and uh, let's jump into the action. But before I jump into that, I think there's a little uh, groundwork that we need to do based on what I have seen in the second front manual, um, particularly pertaining to covered arcs and probably AFV movement. Let's, let's do covered arcs first. They don't really talk about what covered arcs are. I think you get the gist of it from the manual that it's the way your vehicle is pointing and you can only shoot at things that you can see in your covered arc, but they don't really define it for you in the manual, at least as far as I can tell. So I whipped up a quick little graphic here, a couple graphics to show you what a covered arc looks like in second front. So this first image I put up shows you a situation where the covered arc, the vehicle covered arc, and the turret covered arc uh, coincide. They're pointing the same direction, basically towards the front of the vehicle. And it forms a cone. Um, as you can see in the graphic here, the, uh, the red little arrow points to the hex spine. And the two hexes on either side of the hex spine define the rows of the covered arc and everything in between this area shaded in red is everything that the turret and any bow mounted weapons such as a bow machine gun can fire at now when the situation is a little bit different such as you rotate your turret um, you have a situation like this so now the blue arrow shows your vehicle covered arc the, the direction your vehicle is pointing and the turreted covered arc is now turned down this hex spine and this new covered arc is defined by these two hex rows and everything in between and anything mounted on the turret can fire within this red zone such as the main armament a coax machine gun if you have a rear machine gun i think there are some vehicles not 100% sure, in second front that can have rear mounted uh, turret machine guns, possibly on the chassis itself. Basically the covered arc for rear mounted things are opposite of the turret, so it would be back this way. And if it's mounted on the chassis, it's gonna be back this way. So you can see, you can have two different covered arcs. You can fire at things in different zones. And the thing about, the cool thing, I don't know if it's cool about second front is you can spin your turret around as free as you want and shoot, you know, shoot way over here, flip it around, shoot way over here. And there's absolutely no penalty in ASL. You have to pay a penalty for every hex spine you move to shoot. So if I'm have my turret pointed this way in ASL and I want to flip it all the way to this side to fire something, I have to, I have to spin it one, two, maybe up to three hex spines, and I pay a penalty on the two hit for that. In second front, there is absolutely no penalty. You can spin your turret around all day as freely as you want. Uh, I, It's convenient, but it's not really that realistic. I prefer the ASL method where you have to pay a penalty. It makes you think a little bit more about how you're moving your units, your uh, vehicle units when you're going into combat. Uh, let's see. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, vehicle movement. And to do that, let's just jump into the game. If I can find it, I found it. Here we have a uh, Panzer 5G. And several things about vehicle movement that people should know about that, that you may have gleaned 
for moving things around, but I don't think it's fully covered in the manual. First thing is some of the vehicles have a red movement uh, point. That usually, in ASL, that means they have some sort of mechanical reliability problem, meaning they can potentially break down or they stall, consuming a random number of movement points. I haven't had it happen yet because I haven't really used any of these uh, bigger pieces of armor that have this situation, but they are in the second front. There are vehicles with red movement numbers, and I think something may happen uh, once in a while if you try to engage them and move them forward. So there are several states that a vehicle can be in. It can be stopped, which means you're in a hex with the engine off. Um, it can be non-stopped, which means you're in a hex and the engine is running. And you can be moving to a new hex, and obviously the, the engine is running while you do that. And all of those have implications on how hard it is for you to shoot at things, and how much firepower from your machine guns you can uh, put on a target. So right now I'm stopped. If I fired at something, there would be no penalties other than uh, maybe hinder line of sight hindrances or train effects if something's in a building. And you can see my machine guns can fire at full power. Now, even if I don't move, if I just start the engine, if I just hit the on button here, all of these machine gun factors are going to be cut in half. Watch when I do that. Boom. Uh, I'm considered, actually, I think they were cut in quarter, possibly. Because once you start the engine, the vehicle is actually considered to be moving in second front. It's really hard to hit things. It cuts your firepower of your machine guns in, looks like a quarter. Um, but now you can start moving. And that actually costs one movement point to start your engine. Remember that. Every time you start your vehicle and stop it, it costs one movement point. Anytime you change the covered arc by one hex bind, it costs one movement point. You may not be seeing that because you're, you know, you're you're doing this. You're clicking out here and you're telling it to go on this path and it's doing all the calculations and subtracting the movement points. But every time you start, move, change, move a hex, change a hex spine to get into a new covered arc to go into a different hex that costs uh, movement points every one of those things so let me so I started for one movement point let's move over to this hex it's only going to cost me one it's in my covered arc but you can see I'm changing the covered arc from this hex to this hex and you can see it goes from 13 down to 12 so moving into this hex is going to cost me two movement points to move to here Okay, and then I'm going to move into the shell hole hex. I'm not going to change covered arc. I'm just going to go straight in. But then once I'm here, I'm actually going to change my covered arc in the hex. If I can do it to there, and you can see it's going to cost me, I have 11 over on the right there. If I go to this, just change covered arc like that, that costs me one movement point. Now, if you are crew exposed like I am here, you can see the guy the guy is up out of the hatch he's crew exposed when you go down a road each road hex essentially costs a half a movement point not one movement point if only if you are crew exposed if you're buttoned up each road hex still costs one so if you want to go a long distance and you can risk it or you're not in the line of sight make sure you're crew exposed when you're going down a road because you can essentially get double the movement out of it. So if I, I have 10 movement points left, if I move to here and not change my covered arc, it says nine, but it should stay 10 over on the on the card. Let's see what happens. It says nine, I bet you it says nine here. Yeah, it still says nine. Yeah, so I moved two hexes on the road because I'm crew exposed. It only cost me one movement point to go two hexes. So each road hex when you're crew exposed, costs one uh, uh, half a movement point now watch if I hit uh, off here oops if I hit the engine off um, it's gonna expend a movement point I'll only have eight left my machine gun it'll consider me not moving anymore my machine guns they are at quarter firepower they should go up to half firepower see that so every time you move and you want to fire make sure you stop first but as soon as you fire you cannot move anymore 
if you stop for some some reason, you can start up again. It's going to cost you one, and you can keep moving. And come to here, and then you can stop. But as soon as you fire, you are done moving. So everything you do, except changing cover arc, you can do that as freely as you want, anytime you want, even in the middle of firing. I can fire machine guns over here, flip over here, fire my gun, no penalty. But everything you do costs movement points, and it either cuts your machine gun firepower in half or a quarter, depending on if you're firing while the engine is on, because you're considered to be uh, moving or non-stopped in ASL terms. Um, and it, it imposes uh, huge two-hit modifiers um, when you use your, your main armament. Okay, so that's uh, that's the basics of a movement move of a vehicle in a second front. Okay, one final uh, housekeeping thing that I forgot to mention. Let me pop it up here is vehicle target aspects. Uh, in other words, how incoming fire determines which armor factor to use. Again, I don't believe it's covered extensively in the rule book, but this is essentially how it works. What I've done here is I've popped up a, a virtual advanced squad leader map board um, that you can play online, just easier to visualize in 2D. We've got uh, Panzer VI here with its front covered arc in the blue, rear covered arc back in blue, and then the side covered arcs here on the side, obviously. And we have five different incoming uh, fire coming into this Panzer VI. So the ones that are coming in in a clearly defined covered arc are easy. So this is coming in from the front, therefore it will use the front armor factor. This is coming in from the side. It'll use side armor factor. This is coming in from the rear. It's using rear armor factor. Plus, it will get a little bit extra uh, rear target hit bonus, which isn't covered in the manual. It's basically a plus one. Now, these two that come in on what's called the side and front is where it gets tricky in second front and ASL. It may appear, for example, this one is coming in on the front, I'm sorry, on the side, but because it's running along just along this hex spine that forms the front covered arc, what happens is it goes to the covered arc that's the most advantageous for the target and disadvantageous to the firer. So in this case, this is actually considered a front shot and will use the front armor factor. And on the side, if this one comes in and just comes along this hex side that forms the rear covered arc, that actually is considered a side shot, not a rear shot. So make sure when you, and I'll show this in a uh, upcoming video embedded in this video, um, how this works, make sure you're getting a clear, clearly de delineated front side or rear shot that you know what you're getting in other words if you're maneuvering to try to get a side shot you need to make sure you're not coming in right along this hex spine here you need to be off of it just a little bit to ensure you're going to get a side shot same with uh shooting at the rear make sure you're getting a true rear shot you got to be offset on the from this hex spine to get a rear Shot. It's not defined by the covered arc, these these other blue lines. It's defined by the hex spine that forms the first hex of the covered arc. These two, these four actually, for the the rear and the front. If it comes in between them, it's a front shot. If it comes in on or between the front in rear is considered a side shot sorry front and or side shot if it comes in truly between them it's considered a rear shot and you'll get the applicable uh, armor factors depending on which way it's coming in and obviously you want to get a side or rear shot preferably to a front shot so hopefully that helps uh, clear up some of the examples i show later and helps you get a little bit of an advantage to the uh, AI when you're going into a combat with them, okay? But lastly here, I wanna show you 
the mechanics from ASL, which are directly in second front of the two hit mechanics, two kill mechanics, and destruction mechanics. And if, as you've been playing, you've probably been seeing those pop up. You'll you'll get a hit, and you'll get some kind of kill, and you'll see things like immobilization, shock, burning wreck, or your tank is blown up and the crew survives, right? There's a bunch of different things that, that can happen uh, when a vehicle gets hit, and there is a result on that vehicle. And I'm going to show you basically where that comes from, how you can even calculate the percentages that you see in second front. The percentages on some of them are exactly the same, but there's some that are just slightly off by a couple percent, and I haven't figured out exactly why that's happening, so I can't really dig into that. But you can, uh, from the mechanics of ASL, you'll be able to see where these percentages come from. So here we are in the garage, and I have a... Uh, Pan, or a Panzer 6C Tiger on the right, German, and an M, yeah, M4A3 on the left, just for a quick comparison. But I don't want to get in, into the details of head-to-head -head here, right? I want to look at um, how ASL influenced um, Second Front and how you can use that to learn what's going on behind the screen under the hood of the game. So I'm going to focus just on the Tiger. Let me pop up, let me see this here, yeah, okay. Um, on the left are two, the front and back, front and back counters of a Panzer 6E from the Advanced Squad Leader system. And on the right, we have a blown up uh, card from the second front system, okay? Let's do a car direct comparison here. They both have 88L guns, 88L long barrel, uh, 88 millimeter long barrel. They both have a rate of fire of one, which means when you roll two six-sided die in ASL, one is colored, one is white. Uh, if the colored die is one, you get to fire again. In second front, that's equal to a 17% chance. Technically, 16.666 repeating rounding up, etc. cetera. Uh, machine guns. The squad leader, advanced squad leader version has uh, three bow machine gun firepower and five turret machine gun or coaxial machine gun. The second front variant version has exact same thing. Three bow, five turret machine gun. 12 movement points. The movement points in the ASL is red on uh, meaning mechanical reliability problems when you move. The second front is not red, although there are some vehicles with red movement points. I don't know if that signifies anything at this point. I haven't seen anything pop up with regards to reliability in second front. Maybe it's there, I, I'm not sure. And then lastly, on the front, we have our armor factors um, up here on the side. The top number is the front armor factor which is 11. The bottom had number is the side and rear armor factor, which is eight. Um, the square around it means the turret has superior armor, meaning if you get hit in the turret front, the armor factor is the next increment up. And in the ASL system, that's 14 armor factors. It goes from 11 to 14. It's not a linear scale. And I'll show those here in a second. If we take a look at the second front version, um, it has the same information. But the thing is, is the little shields that represent armor factors here, it has one more than the ASL version because in ASL, there's such a thing as an armor factor of zero. It's an armored target. It just has an armor factor of, of zero, meaning it can't be, it can't be affected by small arms fire at all, but it's... For all intents and purposes, when a tank fires at it, it's going to get shredded, essentially. But it cannot that means it cannot be affected by small arms fire. To account for that, the developer of Second Front basically is called a one, you know, one shield uh, icon equal to zero armor factor. So 11 armor factor in ASL is going to have 12 shields in Second Front. It's going to add one to represent zero. Okay. Other than that, they're identical. Now, if we flip over to the back, 
Uh, CS6 means crew survival. If the tank gets blown up and it is not a, a burning wreck, meaning the kill result is not incredibly bad, but it still equals a kill, you roll two dice. If you roll six or less, the crew survives and they and they pop out as a separate counter. And you see that in second front. Sometimes you'll see the, the crew survive. There is no crew survival number on the second front card, but I'm sure it is exactly six. And then the SD7 is Smoke Discharger 7. Um, and if you look up here, Smoke Dispenser, sorry, up here, right below my little yellow thing, Smoke Dispenser 58%. That is exactly equal to the chance of rolling a 7 or less on two six-sided dice, 58%. Um, lastly, the, these numbers on the top, the A6, A5, or A6 slash 5 slash 4, um, the ASL version has, uh, APDS ammo, limited availability. That is not reflected in the second front. There is no, it does not have any special ammo. All it has is, uh, armor piercing and HE. So that is not a direct, uh, comparison. He did not include APDS ammo in the second front version. Okay. Now, what do you do with these numbers? Okay. The first thing you have to do is secure a hit. Now let's take a look at the two hit chart here from ASL. So a, two hit is based on range and I'll mention this in a follow on video talking about actually moving and firing, but try to remember when you're moving and firing that the, the ranges for the basic two hit number is in increments of six. If you see here at the top column, there is a zero to six, seven to 12, kind of that, that pink row, 13 to 18, etc. So every increment of six hexes, Actually, let me, let me put this back up. Let me resize it and just put it down here for reference. Kind of like this. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's a six hex increment for uh, ranges. And every time you go to the next uh, group of six hexes, your chance to hit drops by one... Sometimes, no, it looks like mostly one each range, right? For uh, for vehicles, right? If you're firing uh, your tank or gun at another vehicle, this row is if you're firing your tank or gun and you're trying to hit infantry, which is called aimed in second front. And if you're trying to fire uh, what's called area target type in ASL, which is called unaimed or not aimed in uh, second front. There's various uh, numbers you need to roll to hit less than this number, less than or equal to to hit. And you can see it, it drops off um, as your range goes out. So if you're, you know, if you're maneuvering your tank and you're at eight hexes, but you can get to six hexes, if you have enough movement points to do that, your chance to hit uh, will go up by one. So keep that in mind. If you're just really on the edge of going to the next, you know, next column on two hit, try to eke that movement out so you can get a little bit closer, increase your chance to hit. Now there are several things that can affect uh, your chance to hit. Uh, primarily barrel length, which is a star weapon, L weapon, LL weapon, and if uh, you have no designator as uh, short, long or extra long just a normal barrel so star weapon is short barrel and you can see the as you get out to further ranges it reduces your two hit chance by minus one it, may, it makes it a little bit harder to hit a long barrel weapon as you get out to longer ranges uh you get a plus one to hit so it negates some of that drop off from the range uh on, on from the uh the pink uh row and the, the columns there and then LL is extra long, and at even longer ranges, it gives you an extra bonus even above a long barrel. And if you have just a normal length barrel, there's no uh, modifier to the the two hit number. And then also, if you're firing smaller caliber, such as 57 millimeter, 
or less than 57 millimeter or less than 40 millimeter. Obviously, they are less powerful uh, ammunition, and the drop off for those weapons. Uh, increases as range increases. So I guess the moral of the story is if you have an L gun, a tank with an L gun or an LL gun, and you're going up against a tank with a normal barrel or a short barrel, if you stay at longer ranges, you get a little bit better bonus than they do. In other words, the drop off from the range is going to be much less than the drop off from their range. Um, the other approach is to just get up close and duke it out. Conversely, if you have a long barrel, you might want to stay at distance and duke it out that way. Okay. Uh, so once you secure a hit, once you lo roll less than the number required uh, for vehicle, uh, infantry aimed, or area target type, target type which is unnamed, um, there's a result that may occur. And we're just talking about specifically about vehicles here. So let's go to the to kill chart, see what that looks like. So the to calculate the to kill, if you have an effect, uh, is pretty simple. You take the, the basic to kill number, the pink row here. Let me get up on the right screen. The pink row here gives you your pay, basic to kill number based on the caliber of the gun and the barrel length. For example, we have an 88L here. If we go over here to about three, two thirds of the way over, there's an 88L and it's a 22 kill number. That's the basic two kill number. For the Sherman M4A3, it's a 75 millimeter, no barrel modification. If we go down a few columns, there's a 75 and it's a 14 to kill. Now let's go back to and focus on the, the, the tiger here. So it has a 20 to kill number, basic two kill number. To calculate the final two, two kill number, you essentially subtract the armor factor where you secure the hit on the target from that basic two kill number to get the final two kill number. And if you roll, equal to or less than that, you're going to have some kind of result. So in this case, if we're shooting at the the uh, M4A3, it has an armor, let's say we hit it in the turret front, it has an armor factor of, uh, looks like eight or nine, and the uh, Tiger has a 20, it's going to need basically an 11-ish on two six-sided dice to get a kill. In other words, if uh, this tiger hits that M4A3 in the turret front pretty much anywhere. It's going to go up in smoke. It's probably going to be going to be killed. Um, so you can see bigger guns, longer barrels, have better to kill numbers, lower calibers with uh, shorter, say, short barrels. There's a lot of star barrels here. There's a lot of good, you know, 76 millimeter is a decent sized gun. But because it has a short barrel, its chance to penetrate is pretty lousy compared to uh, 76 with a normal barrel, which has a two kill of 12. If you look over here, nine versus uh, 12, short barrel versus normal barrel. And if we look up even further, a 76L long barrel has a 17 to kill. Okay. Um, now, there are also range modifiers for this. So if you go down to the second part, basic to kill number range modifiers, uh, just in a nutshell, if you're firing at close range, zero to one, there is no zero in second front. I don't think you can, you can't get into the same hex um, as an enemy unit like you can in ASL. So at one hex range, um, there's a bonus to the two kill number. It goes up slightly, plus one or plus two, depending on the, the caliber of the uh, ammunition being fired. At a two hex range, you also get a bonus, but not for larger caliber. Uh, and then it goes to zero. And then you can see there's a drop off for all of them, all the different calibers um, based on ranges, long range. And in fact, some of them can't do anything like 25 millimeter or less can't do anything at range 49 to 54 and those ranges are far beyond the range of anything in this game i think the bit largest map you can make is 50 50 or 52 by 50 or 52 it's around 50 by 50 that's the biggest you can make so 
there is not there isn't going to be anything where the you can't have some sort of result here um, one other thing to mention is you can always get a possible kill if you roll uh, snake eyes in ASL if you roll a two doesn't matter if you know you're firing something that has a seven to kill number against an armor rating of 14 right seven minus 14 is negative seven you can't roll a negative seven on two six sided dice but there's always that chance right you could hit a you could hit the the seam between the turret and the hull and get it just get some perfect shot and it gets in and it could destroy the vehicle um, and that I believe that is in in the system I've I've gotten hits where there's really not a chance of a kill and you get snake eyes and you end up getting a hit or at least I think you're getting snake eyes behind the hood um, behind the screen because you end up getting kills happened occasionally and that's uh, directly from ASL as well now what happens if you get a result let's look at the uh, destruction pulled up the wrong table the destruction table now there are several results like I like I said before when you hit something you can burn it it goes up in a burning wreck no crew survival you can eliminate it meaning it doesn't brew up doesn't turn into a ball of flame it just gets knocked out and the crew has a chance to survive you can immobilize it or you can shock it and immobilization means you hit it in the lower uh, lower uh, structure. You hit it uh, down here, probably in the tracks, in the treads, in the wheels. And a shock means you hit it in the turret somewhere and you've effectively uh, rung its bell. Um, so if the, if the final two kill number generated is less than or equal to half of the two kill number required, it's a burning wreck goes up in smoke the poor crew gets uh, eviscerated unfortunately if you roll less than the two kill number it's eliminated crew can survive if you roll equal to the two kill number it's immobilized if you hit it in the hull and it's shocked if you hit it in the turret and if you roll uh, one if you, if you fire armor piercing and it's one greater than the final two kill number that's a possible shock. That means the crew must basically take a morale check. And uh, if it passes, they're okay. If uh, they fail, they're shocked. And you may have seen that result while you play. You may see you fire and something, I think it says, okay, pops up or something to that effect. That means you basically rolled uh, one greater than, or the, the game engine rolled one greater than the number required to kill it, resulting in a possible shock, and the crew passed its uh, morale check, and it became okay. Now, when you're immobilized, if an AFE becomes immobilized, it's kaput for the game. Um, it cannot move. It can still rotate its turret, and you can still fire at things, but it cannot move. In ASL, the same thing can happen but you can have your crew abandon the vehicle and you can actually take the machine guns out. You can scrounge the AFV, take the machine guns out and you become a crew unit and you can run around the field and do things with the machine gun or without the machine gun if you choose not to. If you're shocked, what happens is the next beginning of the next player turn, you roll for recovery and you're either you recover fine or you remain shocked. Um, and in the second front game, that's shown as, I think it says, uh, okay, or recovered or unknown. Unknown means you did not recover from the shock, which means for that player turn, you're basically sitting there and you still can't do anything. If you fail two recovery attempts in second front after being shocked, I believe the vehicle is eliminated. Ooh, we got through it. We got through some of the AFV and vehicle mechanics uh, from ASL to second front. Hopefully that'll explain some of the things you see vehicles doing and moving around on the board and firing and help you understand uh, what's going on under the hood. And uh, in the next video, part two, 
we're going to talk about uh, a bunch of different examples of how to put this to use to help you survive better on the battlefield with your vehicles, how to assault other vehicles successfully, other infantry successfully, and how to uh, either avoid the pitfalls of close combat or use your infantry to more effectively attack AFVs uh, in close combat, okay? So we'll see you in part two. I hope you found this useful, both second front players and ASL players, because visually, I think there's a lot of uh, analogous information here that both sides can leverage, specifically and especially second front players. If you've liked it, please give me a thumbs up. Uh, and also, please give me a follow. And I want to thank all the subscribers and supporters that have uh, joined the channel recently because of uh, Second Front and ASL content. And I'll see you in part two.